I also want to talk about uh, some of the impact that the U.S. dollar is, or some of the correlation, the relationship that we're seeing as far as rates, treasury markets, and economic data. Don't forget here today we have 730 weekly jobless claims, weekly jobless claims headed our way. Potential to see some movement there. I think there's a lot of focus here already on tomorrow's uh, non-farm payrolls. I think they're looking for 190,000 tomorrow. Expectations are for uh, the unemployment rate to hang out right around 3.5. Uh, 7% to remain unchanged. Now, I mentioned here some of the weakness that we had been seeing in the British pound, uh, in the Canadian dollar. Now, I think the reason that the dollar is not into a new 2018 high is because we're not seeing that weakness in the euro currency. Let's just take a quick look at that euro currency before we bring Bob Iaccino in. And I think this is why the dollar is holding back and not ripping into a new high print. But uh, you guys know what I think. Let's bring in Bob Iaccino. He's the founder and chief strategist of the Path Trading Partners. He's joining us live from the floor of the CME Group here in Chicago. He's just down the street on LaSalle. Bob, good to have you back with us this morning. The dollar <laughs> has me on the edge of my seat. It's had me on the edge of my seat for a while now. I said in the past, it reminded me of the little engine that could. I've also equated it to the old MC Hammer tune, uh, uh, too legit to quit, but now it's starting to remind me a little bit more of a cranky old five-year-old having a temper tantrum. I mean, it's attracting a lot of attention, but it's not getting anywhere. I'm going to have a temper tantrum if you ever play that song on this show. God, that's <laughs> a reference. Um, you know, the dollar is kind of in a trick bag. We are now at about a 77% probability of a December rate hike. So that's dropped from, we were in the 90s a couple of weeks back, I'm sure you remember. So you're now in a situation where it's not just about uh, whether the dollar is valued versus the other currency, but whether there's going to be fewer dollars in circulation in the very near future, which is a direct effect of Fed actions. Are we actually now going to, we're two weeks away. Yeah. We're two weeks away from this Fed rate hike and the probabilities are falling. We're about to go into a Fed blackout period. We've heard a lot of data dependency talk from Fed governors and Fed board members. So are we actually getting the December rate hikes if you continue to see a stock market slide? Are we getting December rate hikes if you continue to see longer term yields predict lower growth and no inflation, which is what they're doing now. Interestingly enough, the twos 10 spread has actually increased a little bit, but it increased to 12. So I don't know if you call that an increase with the inversion of the twos, threes and the twos, fives. So I think you're kind of in a situation where now does the dollar turn around or do we go into a flight to quality bid mm -hmm. in the dollar? So, yeah. you know, under normal circumstances, Ben, you can look at the dollar and say it's going up because of this or going down because right. of that. There's about four or five factors in the next few days that we have to watch. Yeah, flight to quality is definitely one of the things that looked like that helped lift it last time up above the 97 level because as the indices started to rally back a little bit recently, we noticed the dollar came back off. So I'm certainly we're seeing uh, what appears to be a bit of an inverse correlation there, or certainly that flight to quality. Hey, but Bob, one of the things that we've been talking about here on the show this morning was the Canadian dollar, which slipped into a new 2018 low in the overnight session. Uh, I I'm wondering, is some of this associated with, well, I would imagine some of this is crude related as the prices come off a little bit. Yeah. I'd also imagine some of this is recently tied or tied to the Bank of Canada as they left un rates unchanged recently. Yeah, I mean, they have to be tied to that. Canada is, at the end of the day, as developed as Canada's economy is, are obviously a developing nation. They're turning into a technology hub in places like Toronto and to a certain degree Vancouver. Um, but you're still looking at a commodity driven currency at the end of the day. So you're looking at crude oil falling, you're looking at other commodities, physical commodities like iron ore, base metals falling, which Canada has a decent uh, representation in as well. So global growth affects Canada in the short to medium term, crude oil prices affect it directly, and then obviously the Bank of Canada. Who's going to raise rates if it's not the U.S. Fed? Yeah. It's not going to be the ECB. Yeah. It's not going to be the Bank of Canada. Certainly not the Bank of England, given the troubles that you mentioned before I came on. Yeah, they just posted a new 2018 low as well. Hey, Bob, we've got a couple 730 numbers headed our way today now. Weekly jobless claims ahead of non-farm payrolls tomorrow may not necessarily get the attention that it normally would. It's not the only number coming out yeah, at 730, though. Yeah, talk to us about what you think we should be looking for here, if anything, or if these 730 numbers with everything else that's going on in terms of trade, crude, the dollar, if they'll just get kind of overlooked. 
Yeah, they take a back seat unless they're complete beats in okay. one direction or the other. And I, I worry that in case they're good beats, like factory orders, for example, mm -hmm. if factory orders come out really, really strong, there's going to be the perception that this is increased purchasing prior to right. increased U.S. Right. Uh, China tensions. Yeah. So I think they're muted, not just because of the non-farm payrolls. Obviously, being closed yesterday, a lot of this data that would have come out yesterday is getting pushed. Uh, manufacturing ISM is not included. We've got nine manufacturing services and then composite, which has a little bit of the manufacturing figures in there, but it's still a composite. So in other words, it's everything, right? So I think these numbers coming out at 7.30 are going to be slightly muted in terms of market reaction. We got the ADP, which was slightly disappointing. That's really the one I was looking at. Yeah, really uh, tough times to kind of make sense of it all. I mean, a good point there, Bob. Even if we get a strong number here, then there could be talk of how it was front-loading ahead of tariffs and uh, difficult to really understand what some of the economic data is pointing to at this point. But certainly we've seen a tight labor market. Uh, real quick, Bob, uh, we're going to take a break here. I want you to stick with us, though, if, assuming you can, through the break, because I want to talk treasuries on the back side of it. I want to talk a little bit about market reaction to Bob Iacchino uh, will be joining us after the break. He's the founder and chief strategist of Path Trading Partners. We'll be back after this short break. Welcome back to Futures with Ben Lichtenstein. Before the break, we were talking with Bob Iacchino. He's the founder and chief strategist of Path Trading Partners, and uh, he was kind enough to stick with us through the break. Bob, we just got our numbers released here. Let's take a look here because uh, I want to talk jobless claims in a minute, but I want to talk about the uh, non-farm uh, productivity and unit labor costs first. I notice here the non-farm uh, unit labor costs came in a little bit higher than expected at 2.3%, but for the most part, the indices, for the most part, really haven't reacted here. I'm noticing still significantly lower, down over 1% as we head into the open here this morning. Yeah, Benny, I'm looking at the screens here as we're in break and I'm seeing productivity, I'm seeing the unit labor costs. And my first reaction was, that's a shame that didn't come out on another day without all the backdrop yeah. of the other things we had going. Because one of the ways the GDP increases, as you well know, is with an increase in productivity. Uh, seeing that little bit of unit labor costs bump up again, maybe the PCE deflator, which came in disappointing last week. We talked about it then. Maybe that gets a little bit of a bump up. Maybe we get a little bit of a CPI bump. And some of these things that the market is concerned about, which is Fed raising rates and long-term yields showing no inflation at all, that's a concern of the market. As you see again, two's five-year yield curve, still negative, staying negative after these numbers. But given the backdrop of the Huawei executive, executive being arrested, given the backdrop of no comments on that particular event from either the head of the Chinese government or the head of the U.S. executive branch, um, they just get overshadowed. Same hmm. thing with the jobless claims number. And, you know, the non-farm payrolls number tomorrow might even get overshadowed if hmm. we don't get some sort of clarification with that particular event. Well, we know it's a tight labor market. Let's take a look at the jobless numbers real quick so our viewers can see them. Uh, Bob, I just want to point out that new claims came in at 231,000, uh, above the estimated 225. It looks like last week got revised to 235. Now, Bob, I know you dial in on the average, the four-week moving average, rather than the ups and downs of the each individual week. We're talking about 228,000, uh, prior around 223,000. Now, Bob, I'm noticing that treasuries, for the most part, are, well, inching up a bit. They're definitely holding near the highs from yesterday. You've been talking about some of the uh, inversion in the three and the sevens. How significant is this? Because we keep hearing about it uh, being a precursor to recession, but not always, right? No, it's not. And it really has to do with which part of the curve is inverted, how long it's inverted for. Um, it has a very good record, but it's not 100%. And that, again, because those particular points are in flux and they're in flux all the time. If we end up with a three or a four day inversion in the twos, threes or the twos, fives, right. it's not gonna not matter, a it's a deal. blip. Yeah. It won't even be remembered. It won't yeah. go into the scorecard of times that the yield curve inverted. What you're really trying to look at is ultra short to ultra long because what that is for your traders that are watching right now is that is an indication that the Fed needs to raise rates because the short end of the economy is going stronger, but we're not getting that inflationary thing that the Fed is trying to curb in the first place. And I'll point this out. The bond market tends to be smarter 
than the yeah. stock market. Hmm. So when you're seeing that kind of a thing, you're seeing long-term inflation rates. These are guys that have to plan for 15 to 30 years. Yeah. That's why it tends to be stronger. It's not about short-term moves here. So watching this again, we're getting a little bit of the widening at the long end of the curve. That's really what I'm more focused on. But I mean, 12 to 14 basis points, that's flat to me. Yeah. Hey, you know, Bob, I was talking to Oliver about this earlier in the week. Everyone was talking about the impact of rates rising too much too fast. How about the impact of rates falling too much too fast? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I mean, guys that have been around as long as I have, you look at rates rising too fast. You're talking about eight rate hikes in two and a half years. Is that really even I, too fast? And 25 basis points a pop. Right. No, it's not. Not okay. historically. But again, when you look at the fragility of the global environment that we've had, this is something I've seen. I saw somebody posted a chart on Twitter of this steep rise in rates. And that steep rise was from 25 basis points to 220 or so where we're at now in terms of the average fen Fed funds rate. And that's really nothing. You just stretch that chart out and it's just this. It's a very flat move. It's not a huge move on a percentage basis. It is, right? Rates have gone up three times. But 2% is something that U.S. corporations could easily mm -hmm. plan around. Yeah. If we had trade tensions, uh, a trade deal coming, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to point out, if I could, it's a little bit off of the subject, but the arrest of the Huawei executive, executive kind of shows a renewed cooperation between the U.S. and Canada. Mm, so I thought that point. was pretty interesting yeah. as well. Yeah, that shows a kind of solidifi uh, re-solidification of this particular yeah. uh, relationship, sort of a renewal yeah, of that relationship. Trump I know it's a good thing globally, but it's good for North America. Yeah, Trump and Trudeau had some uh, kind of uh, h harsh words, a little go-between there for a little while. Let's talk a little bit about, you talked some about energies and crude oil you mentioned there briefly. Yes. I might be trying to put too much together here, but I like to look at rates tied to energy prices. I'm wondering, Bob, is it too much of a stretch because I'm watching crude, which has come off significantly, and now I'm starting to watch the, the TNX come off as well. You know, I don't think it's, uh, it's unusual at all. I mean, you tie those things together simply because of the amount of debt that the U.S. crude patch has. So if rates rise too fast, that is troublesome there. And at the same time, if you see crude oil prices falling, so their product, we're not talking about Exxon mm -hmm. or Valero mm -hmm. and of all kinds of other businesses. We're right. talking about the shale drillers, the shale sand providers, things like that, where they're affected tremendously by rates. So you want to see crude oil prices rising in that. Again, it's a deflationary aspect of the overall economy. But not only that. Now our GDP, a portion of energy, or a portion of our yeah. GDP comes from energy Good production. Good point. Which was not the case in the past. So it's a big deal if we all of a sudden see reduced drilling, lower prices, affects global GDP, affects US GDP. Yeah, the trickle down or the, the ripple effect is uh, widespread, Bob, to say the least. We appreciate you coming on this morning and helping us take a look at it Good and the event. impact that it has on all of us as traders and uh, our viewers at home. Bob, much appreciated traders. That's Bob Iacchino. He's the founder and chief strategist at Path Trading Partners. Now